Coming up next on this special Art Beat edition of Arizona Horizon, the artwork of Dale Chihuly on display at the Desert Botanical Garden. We'll also check out a project that turns textiles into ground cover art and the moving portraits of World War II veterans. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon's Art Beat. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to the special Art Beat edition of Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. We begin tonight with a remarkable glass artwork of Dale Chihuly. Producer Christina Estes and photographer Juan Magana show us how glass and cactus come together at the Desert Botanical Garden. It's called the Sapphire Star. More than 700 blue to clear spires begin the Chihuly in the garden exhibit. The colors are so vibrant. There's no other artist in glass that's doing what Dale Chihuly is doing. What he's doing in Phoenix is generating oohs, ahs, and questions. Well, what's, a, what's a beluga? I guess they kind of look like whales. So do you think it's like this big like, fish hook? Each piece, from this chandelier to the scarlet and yellow icicle tower, is created by a team of glass blowers with final approval coming from Dale Chihuly. He uh, is probably the most successful um, artist to exhibit in gardens around the world, um, but there is nowhere that he can, has exhibited where he has our plant collection, the beautiful light that the desert has, and then the wonderful vistas and backdrops. It's just a different space for him to see his work. And that's why McGinn says Phoenix is the only garden to host two Chihuly exhibits. The first was in 2008. And we had um, over half a million people visit the garden in six months, which was a record for us. This exhibit features 21 installations spread across 55 acres. Chihuly's signature in every show that I've ever seen, whether it's a fine art museum or a garden, is a boat. Um, he's a collector of boats. And he collects many, many things, but one of the things he's an avid collector of are these um, antique wooden boats. This boat was actually a tender. Um, it dates back to the 1800s, so they're quite fragile when they come. Um, and he loves to put what he calls the millefiori, which is just this wonderful showcase of uh, different shapes and colors of glass into the boat. For more than a year, Chihuly and his team worked with garden staff to pick the best spots. Moving the artwork from Chihuly's studio in Seattle to a canvas in the desert took patience. The glass came in six tractor trailer trucks over the course of three days. Um, they come in hundreds of boxes and each box contains um, pieces of each of the installations. Uh, Chihuly sends a team of 12 down to help us through the installation. They actually do the physical um, installation itself and it took us about two weeks to get it all installed. The Sun was the largest installation. It, it, had, it took the longest to install, about three and a half days, took a team of five Chihuly installers and it has 2,000 pieces of glass. Some colors and shapes are so striking you can't miss them, like these yellow herons. They're very graceful and they're sitting in the herb among herbs. So as you're standing and looking at the, the piece, you're also smelling lavender and thyme. There's um, a, a chocolate flower. So it's just this wonderful sense, ex sensory experience. Other pieces blend in so well, you might mistake them for desert plants. You could stand here for 10 minutes and watch people walk right by it. But when the sun goes down, McKinn says every piece becomes a star. At night, it's a completely different show. All the sculptures are lit, and we have going up the Garden Butte, we have um, 26 neon panels, so the garden's just glowing at night. Keeping all this glass shiny requires the white glove treatment. It takes about 10 hours each week. The best thing I hear a lot is, wow, look at that. I really love that. Um, but for us, you know, we, we are about being the garden. And to have visitors come in and they'll say, wow, look at that. And then they'll go, and look at that plant. You know, that is really cool. Or I hear often just walking around, um, you know, I, I didn't know this place was here or I didn't know how beautiful the desert could be. The Chihuly exhibit runs through May 18th and advanced reservations are recommended. Next, we take a look at a unique project that was recently unveiled in Phoenix. It's a creative effort that involved one vacant lot and hundreds of hands. We're at First Street and McKinley on the uh, northwest corner. There's really nothing here. 
<laughs> um, and that's what we wanted. Where most of us see a dirt lot, Ann Morton sees a clean palette. I love to make, I'm a maker, um, and I love the craft of that. But um, at one point, it just made me feel like I was in my ivory tower making art, and it, uh, who cares? And except for me, of course. When the city of Phoenix put out the call for a public art project to bring attention to empty spaces along the light rail line, Anne came up with an idea called ground cover. And uh, this is kind of a play on words. When you think of ground cover, you think of plant material that uh, is planted to cover the ground. But it's also a uh, thought about covering people that are on the ground. I'm a knitter. I'm a constant knitter. Soon, Allison Ringness can call herself an artist. Each blanket is made up of 28 squares. Allison's blanket will join 299 others to complete the ground cover art project. Whoever is going to have this blanket is going to be homeless. They're going to be on the streets, hopefully getting off the streets, but um, they're going to have something that needs to be machine washed. It's going to go on, you know, on the ground, on benches, all over the place. And they're not going to want something that's going to unravel, you know, the day after they get it. While Allison makes her blanket in Phoenix, other volunteers are knitting, crocheting, and quilting across Arizona, the U.S., and Canada. You know, most of us think of art as a painting on the wall or a sculpture that we experience, and, and that's terrific. But um, there's a new way of thinking about art that it's, it's, it's making context for community or organizations. So artists will go in, they might see a particular need or issue or just uh, a desire to engage with the public and construct an aesthetic experience or intervention in the public realm and that's what socially engaged art is. All these blankets are in good hands. The blanketeers, as they're called, paid for their own materials and shipped their creations to Anne. We will be putting it in rows going this way. Eight months so after her idea took root, all right, thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you. The Ground Cover Public Art Project is unveiled. It's 20 rows by 15. It's impressive to see 300 handmade blankets covering the ground. Each one has its own personality. It's even more dramatic seeing the view from above. Each blanket is carefully color-coded to reveal lush desert flowers. The image stretching 117 by 50 feet. I'm the orange blanket in the top center. Like most blanketeers, Allison shared a message for the person who will receive comfort from her craft. Big things start small. I was thinking myself of the blankets. They started out as bundles of cloth or skeins of yarn, but in the end they became these big blankets and warm blankets with a really big impact. From this lot, the blankets are bundled and given to groups that work with homeless people like Circle the City, a medical respite center in Phoenix. What a cool way uh, to tell people that, that they're important and that we care about them. Reynaldo Garza got the message. My card, uh, what, it, what it says is, it says it's made by Keith, but it's got a, a happy face here. That's basically all it's, it really has on there, but uh, that happy face makes me happy because uh, it, it is the way I feel, you know. I mean, it's like they knew who was going to get it and they, they made my day. I feel this blanket is going to benefit me uh, in so many ways, especially uh, because I sometimes, most of the time, live uh, in a van and this will be my my bed cover, my, my, my everything, I'm going to take really good care of it. It's the best gift that I could ever have. Just discovering what has to be done and what can be done is, is a first step, you know, in realizing that the problem exists. That one, and I'm pretty sure this corner one. Before this project, most of the blanketeers had never met. Well, my original plan was to do, like, different stitches. <laughs> now, they share a common thread. This has been a wonderful experience and a very rewarding experience, so I will definitely be doing more, more projects like this in the future. The Ground Cover Project was funded by the City of Phoenix Public Art Program and the National Endowment for the Arts. 
Ancient people making their way through the Arizona desert had to find a way to communicate with each other. Now, thousands of years later, those ancient writings have been unearthed. Producer Shauna Fisher and photographer Ed Kishel take us on a journey to the past at the Deer Valley Rock Art Center. The Deer Valley Rock Art Center is like most museums. Sure, there are paintings and there are sculptures, but what makes this museum different is its setting. The Deer Valley Rock Art Center is an archaeological site and 47 acres on our desert preserve. The museum is nestled into the Hedgepeth Hills near I-17 in Deer Valley. It's home to one of the best examples in the world of petroglyphs. For thousands of years, people came to this place, either doing travels, um, and, and some of them stayed, and decided to make marks um, in the form of carvings on rock. We call these marks petroglyphs, and these give us an idea of, you know, perhaps what life was like in prehistoric times. We have the largest concentration of rock art in Phoenix, so we have over 1,500 um, marks in one hillside. Museum coordinator Cassandra Hernandez says although we may recognize symbols like human stick figures, deer, archaeologists can't say for sure what the symbols mean but they do know this was the earliest form of communication between tribal people. The petroglyphs were discovered after a series of floods in the 1970s. The Army Corps of Engineers built Adobe Dam here, and at the time, um, the dam was gonna bring development um, to this part of Phoenix, and so um, they recommended that um, a museum was built to preserve the petroglyphs and also to, to function as an interpretive center where people could learn about the history of Arizona. Hernandez says the best time to enjoy the petroglyphs is in the morning when the sun isn't overhead and you can see the carvings clearly. So if you come early in the morning and then you'll get a chance to stroll through um, the acres of, of desert landscape that we have. I think we can hear the quail maybe right now. There's, um, we're a nature preserve so we have many animals and plants that you can learn about. And then um, also look at the exhibits and learn something about um, the peoples who were here before and left the marks. And then also, you know, maybe come for one of our events. Tourists come from all over the world to enjoy the scenery. Chanel Casabon is from Montreal. Smelling the plants, it sounds really weird, but I really enjoy, I mean, I'm used to the very piney smell of Canada. This is a very different feeling. To kind of get an experience of just outside of the, of the city is also nice to feel like you're a little far away from, from everything else. It's really nice. For New Zealander Christy Williams, the combination of the man-made drawings and the nature-made backdrop piqued her curiosity. Um, so we're out here looking at the petroglyphs, um, looking at all the different plants and being told about um, all the different uses, so medicinal and um, yeah, there's edible plants. Um, apparently every single plant out here can be used um, in one way or another, so that was yeah, really interesting. We should all be invested in, in preserving places like this, um, not damaging them and, and, and you know, being able to share them with future generations. But beyond that, also to, to use them as points of departure for our own understandings, right? Like these places give us access to, um, I want to call them emotional geographies, right? The way that we connect to place, to history, to time, to landscape. and you know, also it's something that we want to preserve for other people to enjoy, for other people to have that opportunity to, to reflect um, upon their own lives that way. And so it's really important that we leave things untouched and um, there for centuries to come. The museum was designed by famed architect Will Bruder. He wanted it to look like a time machine, bridging the past with the future. We now turn to an art exhibit that examines the impact of popular culture on society. The exhibit of the Tempe Center for the Arts takes visitors back in time while looking to the future. Producer Christina Estes and photographer Juan Magana show us how past pop icons are influencing the next generation. He's one of the guys from Fantastic Four. Is that Captain America? Yeah. Yeah? They're items few people would expect to see featured in an art gallery. What we've got all along this wall is that we've got famous Batman characters from the 1960s television show. And a lot of these are the v famous villains like Catwoman. But they make perfect sense to Michelle Nichols Duck. She coordinated the exhibit called American Pop, Comic Books to Science Fiction and Beyond. 
It is all an exhibition about um, the, the loves that people have for comic books, science fiction, TV, and film, uh, the real science behind science fiction, and uh, the artists uh, who, live, who are living today that are inspired by all of those things. One artist's love for superheroes led to this unique quilt. It's actual comic book pages, so they're paper. They are stitched together, and in here we've got Batman and Spider-Man and Captain America, uh, different superheroes. He embroiders some details on some of these comic book pages. He also knitted this 10-foot tall Fantastic Four costume. No one really could have worn that. We get some giggles, um, and I think that's okay. And then people think a little bit more about, well, why would an artist make a knitted superhero costume? They might ask the same question about this proton pack built by a Tempe teacher and artist to resemble the one worn in the 1984 Ghostbusters movie. And he studied Dan Aykroyd's uh, costume and he replicated from scratch all of these different parts to make this pack. And he told me that even this part right here, this round area is a frying pan. This rainbow uh, cord, you actually doesn't exist anymore, uh, so he had to order that on eBay. You'll see plenty of items that are hard to find, like Batman books, a helmet, even a compass watch. This is actually my display. I've got uh, a Han Solo gun, I've got Han Solo action figure, uh, Darth Vader, Luke Skywalker, and Princess Leia. And I was really enamored of Princess Leia when I was little, and I wanted to be her. Sci-fi characters of the past have influenced many of today's scientists, including an ASU professor who donated the Star Trek costume he made in college. I think it's as much about the process for some people that are into pop culture, of the collecting or the researching or the making of those things, as it is about the final product. Making connections between fantasy and reality is key to this exhibit. Next to a display of Strange Adventures comic books, you'll find meteorites from ASU School of Earth and Science Exploration. Some of the kids that are looking at the show might be inspired by some of the science behind the science fiction. Oh, there's my favorite. Or the moral stories behind some of the comic book heroes. He's grabbing the girl. Yeah, somebody's going to rescue that girl. And might take that to the next level and either create their own comic book heroes or get more interested in science. The exhibit at the Tempe Center for the Arts runs through June 8th. Admission is free and every Friday night the gallery also hosts sci-fi lectures and discussions. We wrap up our Art Beat special with a look at what has been described as the greatest generation, the men and women who served in World War II. That service and sacrifice is the focus of a new local art exhibit. Producer Shauna Fisher and photographer Ed Kishel give us a look at this moving tribute. Each of these photographs has a story behind it, a story of courage, perseverance, and fortitude. I was a fighter pilot in a P-38 Lightning, and I was in the Army Air Corps. Bill Lancaster was a teenager when he found himself in the middle of World War II in a plane that he had never flown before. This photo shows the cockpit of the plane, hundreds of buttons, and Bill says he had no idea what many of them were for. Well, this particular airplane was, a number, number one, it was multi-engine, it was two engines, and all my flying had been done in a single-engine airplane. And I got into an outfit where all they had was the twin engine airplanes. And I had to go out and uh, learn to fly by myself because it doesn't have one fitted out for an instructor to be in there to give me any instruction. So you had to learn to fly the thing and survive it. <laughs> that lack of training proved to be deadly. Of the 90 men Bill served with, 67 of them never came home. Even now, it's difficult for Bill to remember his time in the war and those who did not return safely to their families. It's hard, it's hard to see. I don't think the, anybody plays it up the, the bad side or knows the bad side. I had guys that went with me to combat. They came over there and 
went down and the first time they got in an airplane over there and tried to get up and fly, they killed themselves. Del Ryland was a farm boy turned fighter pilot. He joined the ROTC and soon found himself here in Arizona. I got my wings right here at Mesa at Williams Field, went over military to Italy and flew there 30, commission, 30 commissions and the war ended. Bill and Dell are just two of the veterans whose photographs are part of an installation at Belmont Village, an assisted living facility in Scottsdale. The nearly two dozen portraits were taken by critically acclaimed photographer Thomas Sanders. What started a few years ago as a school assignment for Tom has transformed into a way to preserve these stories before they are lost for good. My senior year of college, I had a homework assignment just to photograph a portrait of somebody. And living uh, right around the corner from me was this big giant uh, retirement community company. And um, I happened to go there asking the retirement community if there was an interesting you know, person to photograph. And they said, hey, we have this World War II hero. Tom's work caught the attention of Belmont's CEO, Patricia Will. She asked him to take portraits of veterans in all of their facilities. And the reaction that we got far surpassed anything that I could have imagined. Not just because there emerged a storyline from each of these extraordinary veterans, but also because as a result of sharing their stories, often for the first time, they began to engage with one another in very different ways. Experiences that they had often buried in their long-term memory, emerged and created a certain kind of camaraderie among them. For Muriel Pelham, the camaraderie continues to this day. At 92 years old, she volunteers with local veterans groups. Stationed in Europe as a nurse, she spent several years there and came back stateside and continued working in various hospitals. Muriel was one of 350,000 women who served during the war. I guess it means that um, uh, I was probably helping to, uh, the, the women to crack the ceiling because we were, uh, we had a hard time in a lot of things, a lot of uh, opportunities to advance and do uh, other than routine care. So I was glad I was able to uh, do that. With 1,500 World War II veterans dying each day in America, Capturing these photos and the stories is crucial, but it's more than that. What's special about this project is that sometimes the veterans have never had the opportunity to share their stories. So with this project of photographing and interviewing the veterans, uh, the veterans are able to be honored for their first time. And I think that's uh, you know, something very, very special for myself and, and for them. You know, in a way, um, you know, I, I get to give back through art by preserving history. World War II and Korean War veteran Carl Moline agrees. He has never really talked about his time aboard a destroyer in the Sea of Japan. The exhibit is a way for his family and friends to learn more. I think that they can read the uh, items as to what they say, what the uh, different uh, fellows thought about their activity and about their period of time while they were serving. I don't want it to be lost in antiquity, so anything that can be done and said, pictured, and proofed is all to the benefit. The veterans are all very pleased with how their photos turned out, if not a bit surprised. Well, there's everybody else who wonder who it was. Whose picture is it? The, uh, they're never as flattering as you wish them to be, but they're factual and that's the way it is. Well, I was sort of surprised, frankly. <laughs> um, I saw myself holding the picture, and uh, of course that I recognized more than the other because, you know, as you get older, uh, your features change, let's face it. And I am in my 90s, so I'm up there. I thankful that I still have a head of hair. <laughs> I guess that's the only thing of appreciation is I still got little hair left. For Tom, this project brings his family history into focus. His great uncle died in World War II, and his grandfather, a semi-famous photographer, snapped this shot of author Ernest Hemingway. 
It now sits in the Smithsonian. Yeah, when I photograph the veterans, I tend to use really dramatic lighting. Um, some of the veterans have objects from World War II or other wars that they've hung on to all like their whole entire life, and so that helps tell their story, so I have them hold that object up. And on, on top of that, I really try and not overly direct the veterans too much. You know, I have them hold the object. I might have them move a little bit in terms of posing, but I don't want too much of my own idea to be projected onto them. I'm just really trying to capture their essence and their soul. Tom's portraits are much like the men and women themselves, stark, unyielding, and stoic, with hints of vulnerability. They tell an entire life story, one that will now last forever. The whole idea behind the project is making people more appreciative of all veterans and soldiers, and through hopefully creating an interesting artistic portrait of the veteran and reading their story, you know, I really hope that draws them in to, um, to help put their own lives into perspective. Tom's photos have been gathered into an award-winning book titled The Last Good War. If you'd like to see the exhibit, you can make an appointment by contacting Belmont Village in Scottsdale. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us on this special edition of Arizona Horizon. You have a great evening. If you have comments about Arizona Horizon, please contact us at one of the addresses on your screen. Your comments may be used on a future edition of Arizona Horizon. Thank you. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.